actually going to be talking about the same things in a different kind of a way that Matt was talking about. So you can tell just from the title that uh, we're a little bit different, right? Methods of Transitioning from Law to Grace. Um, so this is your VCR manual. Uh, translate, no, but, but really... Uh, Matt talked to me about this idea, uh, and he said, well, I'm going to do this thing about parenting and law and grace, and I thought, man, I've actually been living this. I know exactly what you mean, um, how you do have this kind of mixed world in your lives, and especially right now because I have very young children, and then I have children who are transitioning up to kind of a different stage of life, um, and so I have this mix even in my house right now of law and grace. And I just want to echo what Matt said that, yeah, I am not an expert on this. And I had the perfect analogy, and I see some people out here who will know what it means. Some of you won't, won't probably, maybe. But I, I want you to look, think of me less like Yoda and more like Tommy Lasorda. <laughs> and what I mean by that is Yoda can tell you what to do because he can do it better than you. Uh, not necessarily Tommy Lasorda, okay? Um, but he can help you be better at what you do. And so that's what my goal is today, is not that I'm doing this better than you can do it or that you are doing it, but maybe I can help you be better uh, than you are already doing it, and myself as well. Um, well, let me back up one thing here, and I'm going to click through some, some things. I don't have a slick of an outline as Matt had, and probably the biggest reason for that is I felt like there's no way I can cram everything I need to into this session. You know that, right? I mean, we're, we're scratching the surface of what it means to uh, be a, a Christ-like parent. Um, so just know that today, and I hope if you have questions that you'll ask them, if there's something you're concerned about. I mean, there are things that I wish I could touch on, um, like family worship and discipleship um, and some other kind of big areas that we're, we're just going to kind of skip over because we don't have five, six hours here today, um, nor would you probably want to sit here for that, but um, so I do want to, there is something I'm going to do today as we walk through um, this, and I hope it's something that you'll find interesting. I find it interesting. So one of my favorite lines to parents, to young parents, and really to anybody is is just a simple observation is this. You never have to teach your children to lie. Right? And what I'm getting at there is your children are born, even though they look sweet and they're innocent and they're just the purest being, and they are born with a tendency, and it's not to be good. Right? A child's tendency from birth is to veer toward deceit, deception, selfishness, Lying, Baptist, we call that the sin nature. So you don't have to take a child and say, now, little Johnny, sometimes when you want to people to believe something other than the truth, you need to tell something different. You know, you don't say what actually happened. He's like, oh, okay, Dad. No, you don't do that with a kid. They just do it. You don't have to say, Johnny, if your sister makes you really mad, you might want to ball up your fist and, and swing it like that, and when it hits her, it hurts her. It makes you feel better. Like, you don't have to... You don't have to tell your kids how to be violent and this sort of thing. Uh, so the, the, the trick is, they are born that way, but the trick is you have to correct them and show them the good way. That's why God created parents in that sense. That's where you come in. Your job is to correct that natural bent towards sin. And I, I, again, Matt and I are going to overlap on several things. And love is going to be a theme that comes up again for me. But one of the things I want to do for you today... Uh, some of you have children that are old enough to, to participate. But one of the things I want to do is kind of bring in some of the kids. They're not here today, but Miss Lydia has collected some questions and answers from them during the first session, and I want to share with you some of those as we go along. So the first one is this. How do you know... Now, these are anonymous, so <laughs> now six people... You didn't tell us about this I did not tell you about this. How do you know your parents love you? So I'm going to read you some of the top answers. To give us toys and food, hugs and kisses. That's pretty good. Uh, give us stuff, yeah, is another one. 
they help me with things I need. And here's one you might not have thought that they give us spankings because they want us to be good. <laughs> we'll just say discipline is in there, right? That's an, that's an overachiever. And that's probably somebody who maybe their parents have told them that. And that's a good thing. Well, I, I want to continue the, the theme of law and grace today. Um, but from the hands-on perspective. So the first thing I really want us to, to look at is the law. So why then the law is the question. Galatians 3.19 asks the question, Why then the law? Why do we have the law? And it's a simple question. It was added because of transgressions. And, and in one sense, Paul is saying so that your transgressions can be made known. In other words, like so that you can see the error of your ways. Without the law, there's not really a way to tell where I'm doing good, where I'm doing bad. This is what I think really is children, right? We have the law because of children. Now, that's kind of a little, a little silly, but, but really we have the law to teach, like Matt said, to teach. What it about sums up the law to say it was added because of transgressions. Uh, it was dealing with behavior. You know, in and of itself, it was dealing with behavior alone. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you how we transition from law to grace. But for right now, let's don't overlook that, what it's here for. Its necessary place is to guard your children. Like Matt said, it is, it is here to be that guardian, that tutor, um, and Galatians 3.24 says, says, says the law was our guardian. And again, like he said, that is also the idea of tutor. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Which is funny because, you know, sometimes you can be, like you said, an overachiever. Sometimes you can be an overachiever parent. And there was one of those situations where I thought, I'm really going to give my kids the business. We're at the dinner table and we're talking about stuff. And I was trying to be, you know, I was trying to John MacArthur them and just teach them the law and and grace and all, and they said, you know, why do we have all these Old Testament rules if Jesus comes in and just forgives us of everything? I'm like, well, guys, glad you asked. You see, the law was given to be your tutor. And you can guess what happened at a table with a five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old when I said the word tutor. <laughs> I lost it. I could never get it back. <laughs> they died laughing. They said tutor. So, yeah. It was given to be a tutor, not that kind of tutor, though. Um, so I'm going to try to mix in as many of these things as I can with the kids. Another one here. How do you, oh, let me skip one. What rules do you have at home? So we want to know what rules we have at home. Let's see. If you don't clean up, your toys go in the trash. <laughs> that, sounds like a, that sounds like a good rule. <laughs> Don't slam the doors. Don't interrupt. Don't talk back. Uh, so, so those are some of our favorite rules at home with the kids. Um, so we do have rules, and that's a good thing. The law, oh, I must have gone ahead. The law is given for a, a couple reasons, for protection, for behavior, and for foundation. I'm going to back up, and we're going to talk about protection. So what does the law do for us? Now, when I say the law, let me, let me back up. I guess I didn't explain that at all, really. We're talking about the difference between law and grace. And um, what I want to say to you today is that there are times when you need to have one or the other. And there are times, and probably most of the time, when there needs to be a healthy mix of rules and consequences and grace in your home. Um, and really, you'll see in a very practical way that that time period shifts as your children get older, as they mature, not necessarily get older sometimes, but as they mature and age and in their spiritual life as it, as it grows and matures, you want to shift this emphasis from, from expectation of obedience to um, expectation of growth, that is, character. So that's basically what we're talking about today. So when we're in that first phase of the law of rules and obedience, and when I'm talking about small children, I'm going to say arbitrarily, I think, maybe not arbitrarily, but in my best guess, you're looking at an age where you start to transition away from that in that kind of kindergarten age. So if you have a two-year-old, three-year-old, probably even four-year-old, you're looking at the law right now. You're, you just need them to know, don't run into traffic. 
and you don't need them to know because Jesus loves you. I mean, that's great, but first, don't run into traffic. So the law is here for protection. It is to keep your children safe. This is the, the number one thing, right? So why the law? Why have rules, consequences, protection? It's very simple. You know, don't go near the pool without a parent. Uh, don't talk to strangers. Again, don't go near the street. Don't climb on the kitchen counters. Don't play with knives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have rules to keep children safe. We also have rules to correct, modify behavior. Uh, don't spit on people is a good rule to have in your house. Um, don't pee in public is a rule that I saw someone break yesterday. Um, and it was a grown man, so... <laughs> Um, take off your muddy shoes before you come in the house. So, again, it's not always necessarily life or death issues, but we need to, we need to teach children some basics of life, so we use these rules and consequences for protection behavior. A and the most important part is the foundation. We're trying to, ultimately, we don't just want people who obey the rules, but we want people of good character, Christ-like character. And so right now, when they're in this young stage, and many of you have children here, um, if you don't, you can still apply some of these principles. Um, but right now at this stage, this younger stage, is where you lay the foundation upon which you build uh, character and the room to grow in Christ at a later stage. So this is a time to build foundation for character, for things as you teach them to share with your sister or be kind to one another or don't be selfish or you help those in need or be a friend to the kid at school who nobody wants to be a friend with or, uh, you know, these sorts of things. But realize at this point, your kid does not know the difference between don't run into the street and be kind to others. It's a rule. It's the same. It doesn't. So this is why you're helping them work through. And as your kid gets to the point to where they understand that that's different, then we start to begin to transition into the grace, into um, the character development. So the biggest kind of, I guess you would say, method, this overarching method is the law. How do we do this? What are we looking at? It's consistency. So at this stage, it's survival mode, too. We're looking at survival mode parenting, um, consistency. So I want to read to you real quickly what your kids say about rules in your home so do your parents ever change the rules uh so someone says some have and they're glad it depends on what it is uh depends on what the rule is uh so that was good i was i was i don't know what i was going to get with these and what i was getting at with that question was Thinking, it, it is difficult when a parent changes the rules, and when one day it's one thing and the next day um, it's another. But um, you would be shocked to know how much a child can handle as long as their life is stable. Um, you know, children are resilient as long as they have structure, as long as they have something to hang on to. Um, now, when I say consistency, we don't necessarily mean that you're planning their entire lives, like every day they wear the same shirt and they have the same thing for breakfast every morning. Um, but consistency, first of all, with rules and boundaries. Children need boundaries, whether they know it or not, and they, cr they actually crave rules and boundaries. And uh, to allude to Matt's point earlier, you might think that a child really wants to run wild and free, and they might think that they want to run wild and free. But in reality, they crave rules they crave boundaries um in general you're not stifling children with rules many people you might think that i don't want to stifle them with rules but if you're concerned about that then i guarantee you're probably not doing that um you know richard foster is a is a quaker who uh wrote an important book about spiritual disciplines and the whole point of the book was discipline is freedom is what he says and what he means is if you if you will discipline yourself let's say for example to practice the piano at some point you'll be free to play whatever song you want i'm not free to play the piano well i i can play it um i don't know how but i can i can bang on the keys and it sounds horrible uh, but i'm not free to do that so but you can go too far of course you can be overprotective 
right? Trying to keep them from harm or, you know, and you're just hovering and making sure, you know, they don't, you know, do this or that or making sure they wash their hands 40 times a day and make sure their shoes are tied or else they might fall down. And you can do that or you can be controlling. Um, you know, you won't teach your children much if you do everything for them. In some ways, you have to loosen up control. Or you can, you can be nagging. You know, again, stop doing that. No, do this away. Don't do that. Calm down. Quiet down. Go here. Do this. Do that. You know, just nagging and making them do every last thing exactly the way you want it to do. But you need rules. More importantly, you need consistent rules. Uh, the rules don't have to change. They should not change on a whim either. You know, for example, one day it's no cookies before dinner. We're just, we're not, we don't do that here. We don't do cookies before dinner. You're going to spoil your appetite. And the next day, can we have a cookie before dinner? Yeah. The day after that, you see kids sneaking a cookie before dinner, and you think, well, I mean, what's the harm? And then two days later, I told you no cookies for dinner. And it's a silly example, but you, you're teaching your kids that um, rules are fluid, they can't be trusted, and the parents are arbitrary. So rules need to, don't need to change at your whim. Secondly, don't make unrealistic boundaries for your children. Don't, don't make boundaries you know your kids really can't keep. Um, now, I could have said a bunch of examples for my children. I, did, I really intentionally avoided using examples here because I want you to think about that for your own children. And you know when you're doing this, when you set up unrealistic expectations for your children, especially in rules, because you're setting them up for failure. If you know they're not going to achieve it and follow it, now, I agree, there are some rules you just have to have. So, uh, you know, there, that, that's one thing. Um, but either what's going to happen with this is you're going to set up kind of gotcha rules so that you can catch them in disobedience. And I've, I've heard parents, I know very closely some parents who do that. They, they set up rules in such a way so that they can catch their kids disobeying. Uh, and that is not how the Father does for us. And that is not how we ought to model parenting for our children. It's not... It's not a, let's see who can catch the other one or who can get away with the other. Um, if you don't do that, you'll overlook their disobedience, right? Or if you, if you set up rules that they can't keep, then you're going to end up not catching them, but kind of saying, huh, well, you know, I knew that was going to be hard, so I'm just not going to hold them to that rule. And you've taught them that rules are important to follow. Um, don't set up rules you can't really enforce, because then you set yourself up <laughs> for failure, all right? Uh, one of the things that I think about when when we were when I when our kids were younger, Kylie's not here, so I can tell this. Um, we were on vacation somewhere, and the, I think it was one of the oldest kids. Will probably he's acting up, and she's like, "Well, we're just gonna we're just not gonna go to the beach." I'm like, "I drove six hours. I rented a hotel room. We're going to the beach." <laughs> like. I mean, you can do what you want with him, but we're going, you know, it's like you, we're not going to hold that rule. So what's going to happen when he calls your bluff? You're going to set yourself up for failure. You're going to undermine your own authority. I remember a time when my dad did that with my brother. My brother was probably the st most stubborn kid I've ever known, including all my children, which is saying a lot. And my dad told him one time, we were driving down the road somewhere. I don't remember the whole situation. I was young, but I do remember this. He was doing something, and Dad said, if you don't stop that, I'm going to put you out of the car. We're just, we're just driving down the road somewhere. And of course, he kept on whatever. So Dad pulled over to a rest stop and put him out. He said, are you ready to apologize? Are you ready to? Nope. So Dad said, okay. You sure? Get, you know, he goes up the car, and I'm sitting in the car. I'm like, are we leaving or what? You know. And so, Yeah, and my dad being my dad, he drove away, right? <laughs> Um, left my brother sitting there at the rest area on the curb. But, of course, you can't do that. That's illegal in most states. And so <laughs> Dad had to come back. He had to come back and get him. And when he comes back, he's still sitting there like, yep, I knew you were going to come back. And, of course, what's Dad going to do at this point? Get in the car. And so, yeah, he just undermined his authority there. Uh, but the biggest part of consistency uh, with most things is combating lazy parenting to be honest with you um matt touched on this too parenting is work 
And it is 24-7. And you, if you have a spouse that helps you, um, then you're blessed. And, and, and thank God for that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that, that you can take a day off in parenting. Sometimes, you, like I said, you'll have that help. But most of what I have seen, most of what I have felt, most of the failure I have seen in this area is purely just lazy parenting. Like Matt said, I'm tired. I don't want to deal with it. Or on the other hand, I'm going to force the rules that, that make me more comfortable. And I'm not going to worry about the rules that I just really don't care about. Um, and, and what you end up doing is basically creating your own little kingdom where you have these little servants who do what you say, when you want it done, how you want it done, as long as they stay out of your hair, um, you know, as long as they don't make noise and you're trying to watch Walker, Texas Ranger, you know, and this sort of thing, <laughs> then you're fine, right? It's, it's lazy. Parenting is hard, even when you're tired, even when you're irritable, even when you've had a bad day. Even when you've been parenting all day and you just need a breaker, you're going to lose your ever-loving mind. you got to stick with it. Parenting rules and boundaries, consequences. So at the same time, uh, this is important. P consequences should be consistent. The same thing for, for, all, alter or for all infractions, if you will. Um, again, this teaches consistency. It's also for you, right? It's also for you, so in that moment when you don't feel like really disciplining, or you, they look at you and they're like, Daddy, what? And you're, you know, you have something to go to. Or that moment when you're infuriated and you want to ground them for seven years, and, and you just, you have this to go to. You say, okay, the punishment or the disciplinary action for not putting the toilet seat down is whatever. You have to clean the bathroom tomorrow, something. Whatever you do in your home, it's simple. Um... Something as simple that works for you. Um, and sometimes, honestly, that means more work for you. Sometimes it is hard. And again, you might want to show grace and mercy in these cases. Uh, I'm not saying you have to just be, like Matt said, a drill sergeant or some kind of prison warden where you know, you're looking to catch your kids. But don't use that as an excuse to say, well, I'm just being a gracious parent. You know, Kylie comes in and the house is a mess and there's food everywhere and the doors are open and kids are running around, you know, screaming and hitting each other with sticks. And I'm just being a gracious parent today, babe. <laughs> today was a grace day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, no, we need consistency between um, transgressions. We need consistency between children. I know that's kind of obvious. But let me say this. When I say that... Uh, we treat our children the same, but we don't necessarily treat them the same. So, for example, I have a child that loves reading, um, and I have a child that, that loves tablet screen time. Um, now, if I go to ground them, I'm not going to say both of them did the same thing. I'm not going to ground them both from reading. I know it sounds like you're like, wow, who are you, Abraham Lincoln's dad over here? But I will. I'll ground you from reading. I don't care. Uh, I'll ground you. <laughs> But, but really, you know, and I'm not going to ground him from schoolwork, but, you know, the little comics and stuff that he likes to read. And, and it's because I, I'm trying to treat them the same in that I want the discipline to mean the same thing to both of them. Um, and I'm consistent in that way, not necessarily the exact same thing, but consistent in the same sort of punishment I'm giving out of it. I keep saying punishment. I really don't like that word, and I, I don't know why I keep using it, discipline, really. Um, we don't have a punitive system where I'm trying to, you know, um, atone for sins. I'm really just trying to course correct. Um, so, structure. Um, consequences. Structure is the last thing under consistency. So, it, it's another form of consistency. And it, it refers to something as simple as the logistical side of your family. I love it, so I'm, I'm going to try not to be too biased and say, you just got to do this, you got to try it as awesome, like some kind of drug that you really need to, because to me it is kind of like a drug, I love structure. Uh, but, but what it does for you is undeniable. Um, it builds a framework for you, again, to be free to parent in other ways. When you don't have to think about planning a meal on the fly or... Uh, when the kids are going to bed, and do we go to church this Sunday, or where are we going to put this toy, or who's going to do what chore, or are we going to do this thing on Saturday? When you have structure, it frees you up, and it, it, it de-stresses your life. And it also gives the children 
the same exact thing. Children flourish with structure because they're not worrying about things. The things that you worry about, they worry about. Trust me, in my house, my kids worry more about preparing supper than I do. Like, I'll come in, and I'll try to get supper ready, and, and I will have at least seven questions about supper before I'm through with it. So much so that I now have a rule in my house. I, I told Becky in the office the other day, I'm like a POW with supper. If you come to me, it is, I don't answer questions about supper. I just, I will, I will literally tell my children, I say, you know the rule, I don't answer questions about supper. <laughs> they say, well, what time is it? I don't answer the questions about supper. What are we having? I don't answer questions about supper. Is that spaghetti in the pot? I don't answer questions about supper. And you might think me hard, but, but just give me a break here. The first kid comes in, 4.54. What time is supper? Uh, I don't know, whenever it gets, two minutes later, the next kid comes in. Dad, when is supper going to be ready? I don't know, in a few minutes. The third kid comes in. Dad, I'm hungry. When is supper ready? I don't know. When supper, this is the third time. You know, and it's that kid's first go around. It's my third, right? And so I've just learned this is part of a, a good, but, it, uh, you know, it's something that I do for structure. We try to have supper at the same time, but even so, the kids are really concerned about it. Uh, but don't, it doesn't mean you can't be spontaneous. As a matter of fact, I find that structure helps you with that. You know, if you have things planned out, then you know when you can do things, and you know what you can move around. Trying to be spontaneous when you don't have anything really planned out, um, you kind of get yourself in a mess sometimes, but... But it is, the bottom line, it is good for your house. It's good for children. Um, it's not a law or something the Bible says you have to do or you'll you know, be a bad parent. Um, the law as a tutor. Remember, we read this earlier, but the law was a guardian. It was our guardian, our tutor, until Christ came. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian or under a tutor. And as Matt said, um, the guardian is a guide. Among the Greeks and the Romans, the name was applied to a trustworthy slave who were charged with the duty of supervising the life and morals of boys belonging to the upper class. And they were not allowed as much to step out of the house without, uh, without the tutor before arriving at manhood. So this was, a, this was a, pretty serious, a pretty serious position. This was a very clear illustration when Paul said this to the Galatians. They knew exactly what he was talking about. And, and when you say it, we, you know, we tend to downplay the law, but that's a pretty big deal. The law is very important. Um, so we don't just throw it away. We use it. One of the best things we can use the law for early on is to begin connecting the language of God's word to their lives. So when your children are young, you can say things like, say you're sorry, or you can say, ask for forgiveness. Um, now, which, what does the Bible say? Now, now, I'm not saying like this is, again, like you're doing something wrong. But if when he turns 10 or 11 or 12, I'm going to hand him a Bible and he's going to look in there and it doesn't say, say you're sorry. You know, it's helpful to begin using the language of Scripture. They're going to learn language anyway. Why not let them learn the language of Scripture? Ask for forgiveness. Um, repent. Uh, believe. Have faith. Confess your sin. Um, I teach my children about death, not, not morbidly, but if they don't know about death, they, they can't understand sacrifice. They can't understand uh, punishment for sin, ultimately. They can't understand salvation. They don't understand the Bible. Um, they don't understand the b very beginning, Adam and Eve were sentenced to death. Um, and, and the way I look at it, you know, if my kid was growing up on a farm, they'd know about it by four anyway. It's not like we're doing something crazy here. It's a part of life, and, and me personally, I don't think it's something we ought to shelter our kids from. If you do, you know, that's, that's up to you. But I would say you're going to have a hard time talking about the gospel if your kid doesn't have a concept of, of death. So uh, connect the words to biblical words. One of the main reasons is so, you know, the Bible has a power to change hearts. It is a powerful book. It has a power in and of itself. And so one of the things I, I'm able to do now is quote Scripture to, to the children. And we talk about Scripture um, because we've learned those biblical words. Um, so instead of just saying, share with your sister, I can say, 
You know, God says in Philippians, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but with humility count one another as more significant than yourselves. Do you, are you counting your sisters more important than you, do you think? Or do you think you're the most important person in here? You know, you can take that and go right to the Word um, if you have, like, this biblical connection, if you're using these words. I know it sounds really concrete and simple, but, hey, that's kind of what I'm here for today. Um, so, secondly here, laying the foundation upon which to build Christ-like character. This is really what we're doing. Under the law, you are protected. Your children are protected from harm, physical, emotional, spiritual. This is what the law is for. It is a guide, but it's also a protector. It's a tutor. Uh, under the law, your children learn to respect authority. They learn right from wrong. They learn rules and consequences. They learn to trust the lawgiver. You know, in this case, it's you. As they grow and mature, it will be the father. Um, you know, my father was a very strict man, and uh, I, I learned to trust him in, in part because of this. But one of the things I found really interesting looking back on our life, he was a minister, and so I saw him in different contexts. And he's been a minister of music pretty well everywhere he's been, and a lot of times a minister of youth, which if you know my dad, you would probably cringe at that thought because he is a very strict, he's a very my way or the highway kind of guy, and he's a physically imposing figure, especially in his younger days. Um, and so, but I, I'll never forget when I was a kid, a uh, young man, too, too young to be in the youth group, we were at a very difficult church. It was in a neighborhood that was rough. The kids were doing things I can't even mention in mixed company. Uh, it was bad. And uh, some of the kids, you know, were caught up in some really bad things. And uh, one kid in particular, I remember... Chad was his name. He ran away from home. He probably d stole a car or something and, you know, was afraid to come home. And this is the kind of thing they did. And he said, I'll, I'll come home, but I'll only, I'll only come home to Brother Ron. Like, I will only come home to him because he's the only one there. My dad was not a nice person. <laughs> he was not a, just a loving, come here, buddy. My dad was going to chew him out. He was going to lay him out. Uh, and this happened kind of over and over. We saw this happening. These kids that gravitated towards my dad, and I, I think it was because it was because they felt this kind of care, this love for the lawgiver. Because what they found was he doesn't. He's not my dad. I mean, what does he care if I get caught doing this or that? He must actually care about me, and he did. You know, it wasn't just about keeping the rules so that Brother Ron looked good. It was keeping the rules because he cared about you. Um, and, and don't be afraid to push your children away with boundaries and consequences and structure. Um, for a lazy and selfish, self-righteous parent, these things can be a weapon against their child. You've all seen that. You've all seen the overly strict parent who does it just to keep a certain household or something. Matt kind of mentioned that ministers are really bad about that. You know, I do remember as a young child the same kind of a thing. The same dad would turn to me and say, you cannot do that. Well, so-and-so is doing it. I don't care what they do. You're my son, you know, <laughs> and you, what you do reflects on me. And partly he was right, but partly I thought, well, that's just not fair. But for a loving parent, these are tools that help shape their children. So those are just some basics of the law. And, it, you know, again, just scratching the surface here. But what we really want to do is transition from law to grace, from hands to heart. That is, what they're doing to who they are. Right? When they're young, we, we really want to make sure they're doing the right things and we're laying a foundation. But at some point, we transition to talking about who they are. And it happens probably as early as you know, four years old or so, um, depending on your kid. Uh, so transitioning from hands to heart. And we'd ask the kids another question here. We asked them, why do you think, let me find that question, why do you think your parents discipline you? And what do you think they said? So basically we got one answer more than once to teach us that it's not okay to do bad things. It's not okay to do bad things. So your, your kids actually get it. 
your parents, your kids actually get it. They know that you're disciplining them to teach them and to help them. The big, the big transition here is we no longer see consistency and boundaries that are the key to guidance, but we shift to character. Um, uh, I must be missing something here, too, because really what we're shifting from is how you measure success as a parent. And I think I will get, on the, get to that later, but in case I don't. You're shifting how you measure success as a parent from how well-behaved your kids are to how much they grow um, and what kind of a person they are. Um, so in this stage, we shift from kind of being teachers to being more like coaches and counselors. It's not just don't do this, don't do that. It's why do you think you felt like that? Or, or how can you change that in the future? Or you know, this sort of thing. Let's see. Let me say, um, this is it's a lot more work. <laughs> Training somebody to behave and, and kind of working with the hands is, is daunting. But, but when you shift to this, the, the heart shepherding, as Ted Tripp would say, one of the resources I want to share with you. Um, it is so much more difficult, so much more time-consuming, and it just sucks the life out of you in a good way. Like you're, Let me rephrase that. You're pouring your life out much more in this way and who you are um, because we're not just going to stop at don't lie. We're going to say, what, what made you say that to that person? Were you afraid of getting in trouble? Is that why you... You did that. Did you not want the consequences? Were you willing to do something wrong to avoid bad consequences for yourself? Or were you embarrassed of the truth? You didn't want them to find out? Or did you think you would get something that you really wanted from telling that lie? Or were you trying to hurt somebody? Were you trying to make someone else feel bad or look bad? Did you think people would listen to you and you really wanted people to care about what you said? Why, why did you do this? And we're helping our children work through the heart issues. Um... And I know it's overwhelming, and it sounds like, to me, it would sound like, man, I, <laughs> I've got to have a counseling degree or something just to parent. But in reality, you don't have to have a counseling degree, but it's not okay just to say, well, that's hard, and I don't want to do it. It's not okay even just to say, that's hard, and I don't want to learn to do it, or I, d- I don't want to put in the effort, um, or I don't want to get better at that. One thing I have found with kids, even if you don't really know what you're doing, your heart will come through. And I know that sounds mushy, feely kind of stuff, but it really will. If they feel like you're trying to help them, and if you are actually trying to help them, it helps. You may not have the right exact words, but if your heart is to try to help them understand why they did what they did, helping them grow, helping them process their their motivations and their heart, um, it helps. They may not. They may need discipline to correct their behavior, um, but if you teach them in love, it will always. It'll always work out. Now, this is a long passage. Matt already read this, but essentially, this is talking about the transition from law to grace. A tutor was necessary for a time, but when we graduate from law to grace, now we operate under faith. Again, the law doesn't disappear. The law doesn't disappear. This is where we, we shift the measuring of success. I already mentioned that. But um, the measuring of success under the law is measured by rule keeping. Are my kids, as Matt said, staying in bed? Are they eating their vegetables? Are they obeying the first time right away? You know, these are things that we look at when they're younger. We don't necessarily throw it out the window. You can't just say, well, when my kid is 16, I don't have to expect them to obey me anymore. Um, but this is the major thing we're focusing on. And in grace, we're measuring by growth. Is this kid a better person than they were last year? And don't measure by day by day. Don't measure week by week. Because a lot of times you'll get caught up as a parent and saying, I thought we dealt with this issue, and here he is spitting on kids again. And I'm saying, this was, this was something I actually dealt with in, in my home. I, I, I really don't have a problem with it, but we had one instance in my whole, of all the kids we've had so far, a, a kid spitting on someone, it just blew me away. So I was like, where, first of all, do you see people spitting on others? I don't, I mean, how do you just know to do that? That's a weird thing to figure out. 
Um, and secondly, like, where does it come from? Like, all of a sudden, we're spitting on people. I've never, we don't have this problem at home. We've never had it before. Um, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, but, but we measure success by growth. And uh, I will come back to that spitting incident because I want to tell you how we handled it. Um, so what do we measure? Growth and Christ-likeness. Um, essentially, and I could tell you what all that looks like, but I don't, I don't need to go into detail there. We want to focus on the trajectory of their growth, and we want to take the long view here. Um, character by growth, Christ-likeness, the long view. In other words, again, not measuring by day by day, but long view. And I would encourage you to even step back as a parent before you start worrying to take maybe a whole year in focus and say, you know, is my kid better than they were last year? Is my five-year-old better than, you know, or is my six-year-old better than my five-year-old or ten-year-old better than my nine-year-old? Um, you know, the same kid, obviously. Um, taking your benchmarks for long periods of time. Um, we want our children to learn a life led by the Spirit. Let me say, too, that this is a transition so I think you probably already know that. But when I say transition, what I'm saying is as opposed to like a shift overnight. So in other words, it's not like one day I have a four-year-old and I'm just all law and rules and consequences. And the next day I'm like, okay, forget about the law. Now we're on grace and we're just, it's all about focusing on your character. It's a transition time. You know, these times meld together and you probably, you'll never get away from law completely, I would say, probably until your, your child moves out of the house, really. Um, there's got to be some sense of rule-keeping um, in your home as you're, you're the parent. Um, but we do begin that shift to move away. And quickly, I want to share with you some just some practical methods. I say quickly because I know my time is running out here. But um, first of all, practical methods. Parenting, put in a lot of effort in this. It's easy to set up rules and consequences, but parenting in grace requires more than simply winding up the rules and consequences and letting them go. You have to nurture the relationship. You have to manage it. I hate managing things. I'm, I love to administrate. I love to do all the work up front, set everything up so that, so that all I have to do is tip the first domino and everything just goes. So that's not how parenting works. It's very difficult for me in that respect. Secondly, explanation. Remember, we're practical right here. Take time to explain yourself when you're talking to your children, especially as they grow. When they're young, I don't really do that. When my three-year-old asks me why, I don't, I don't, I mean, sometimes I'll give her that, but most times she doesn't care or know. Um, even my four-year-old, I might give a simple explanation because it's the best thing for you, because it's right. But as they get older, I want them to understand more than that. I want them to see my motivations. Um, I, I want them to see how I'm caring for their souls and for their bodies and their hearts. Um, and I, I want them to know what I'm thinking and doing. Um, third, listen. So we explain, we talk, and we also listen. With my older children, I encourage back and forth. And, and again, that's something that's not from the old days, right? Children are to be seen and not heard and... Uh, but I have found often I make mistakes in parenting if I don't listen. You know, I jump in, there's two kids crying, I just go after the biggest one, right? Because I just assume they're, this, this one caused the whole thing. Um, or maybe just the small one is crying and I go after the big one. Whatever the case may be, but, but take time to listen because I also want to know what's in your heart because it's not enough at this stage just to say we don't hit. What I'm trying to do now is saying, what did he do that, that made you angry? Well, he took my toy. And then we can have this discussion about, well, you know, is not having what you want worth being violent to someone or disobeying mom and dad? You know, this is a heart issue, not just a toy issue. You need to repent to God. You need to tell your brother you're sorry. And, yeah, he did something wrong to you, but that does not make it okay to do something wrong to him. And so you have this conversation, but you won't know that if you just jump in. And, well, I saw him hit him. So we're going to discipline and move on. We're listening. 
And oftentimes, this is the hardest thing for me because when I say listen, I, I, when I say listen, I don't just mean let them tell. What I mean here is you have to dig sometimes as a parent. You have to dig out of your child the reasons and in in what's in their heart. My 9-year-old, my 10-year-old, especially my oldest child, he has a very difficult time describing, you know, being introspective. To him, the world is black and white. You know, why did you do that? Which is a terrible question to ask a kid, by the way. You'll never get a good answer. Uh, the best answer that I, I've ever heard is because I wanted to. Uh, and it's the most honest and true answer. Why did you hit him? Because I wanted to. I can't argue with that. I guess you did. <laughs> but that's not really what we're trying to get at. We're trying to get at what did you have or what did you not have that you wanted? What did you get that you didn't want? Uh, what made you upset, angry? Were you jealous? Were you a friend? Were you scared? Why did you do this? Um, so the most difficult thing here is to draw out your child's heart. I wish we could spend probably a whole session just on that. Love, to echo what Matt said, always parent in love, never in anger. Now, I'm not saying you're going to bat a thousand on this, but you ought to try. You, you really ought to try. Um, and speaking of repentance, if you don't, <laughs> parents, we need to repent too, right? We're, I mean, when we fail in parenting, it's not just a, oops, let me start over. I'm not saying you need to go to your child every time and say, Dad is a horrible father, please forgive me. Sometimes you might need to do that, but most of the time you just need to pray and ask God to forgive you. You might need to talk to your spouse um, because they're, they're children too. You know, if somebody yells at my kids and they don't deserve it, it makes me upset, even if it is my wife. I don't like it. Um, so, you know, or, or vice versa, you know, I need to say, I shouldn't have yelled at the kids, I'm sorry, talk, you know, get this straight with the Lord. Parenting in love. Um, a, a good way to do this, I want you, if you can stop and think about this, some people say count to ten or something like that, the best way that I can think of to do this is before you do anything to discipline, even before you yell at your kid or talk to your kid, think about, would I, would I do this tomorrow? If I had time to process the situation and see what they're doing and think about it and sleep on would I react this way tomorrow with perspective? And if you wouldn't do that the next day, don't do it in the moment. Empathize. Uh, it's not the same thing as sympathy, just feeling sorry for them. And, and empathy, we, we realize that to an 11-year-old, a video game is a very big deal. Seriously. Uh, to to a, an 8-year-old, you know, somebody using their blankie is a big deal. To you, that's nothing. But, you know, we're not dealing with you. We're not dealing with, you know, somebody scratched your car in the parking lot and see how you act. You know, if somebody takes my blankie, that's one of the six possessions that I have. <laughs> it means a lot to me. Um, it's been my friend through thick and thin, and you just come and snatch it away like it's some sort of trash and how dare you, and how am I going to sleep tonight, and where am I going to find a new blankie? And If you can put yourself in your children's shoes, it doesn't mean you overlook their sin, but you can have a lot more empathy for them in punishing and understanding and in disciplining. And, and the last thing, explore. What I mean here is explore the heart matters. For every sin, there's a heart issue at work. Um, and again, this is probably the hardest one. Listen and explore really the same thing, I guess, in a lot of ways. Um, and I, I wish we had time just to go through all of this. But this is probably the most important thing. And I would recommend a resource to you um, here, Shepherding God's Heart by Ted Tripp. The book looks a little different now, I think. Uh, but this is probably the best resource I have read on helping your children get to the heart of the matter. Uh, it's one of the best parenting books I've read, actually. So... Take note of that if you want to check that out after class or after the session, you can. But helping them get to the heart of their matter. In other words, not just, again, don't hit, but, but why are we acting violent? What, what's, what's at the cause of that? Because you can train a hand not to hit, and the heart issue still remains. It comes out in different areas, or it lays dormant, comes out later. Um, finally, your growth facilitates their growth. Here's where it hits home, right? You don't have to be super parent or super spiritual to be a good parent. Your kids might outgrow you. Hopefully they will. They might grow to spite you, but why would you want to make them do that? 
Why would you want to make it more difficult on your children to grow? Every step you take forward is a step that it's easier to lead them in taking forward. And when you don't know the word of God, it's difficult to teach them the word of God. Uh, and when you, when you don't deal well with uh, disappointment, it's difficult to help them work through disappointment. You see where I'm going with this? Again, don't take that to mean you, you have to wait until you're an expert. Take that to mean take wherever I am now and move forward. And realize, parents, that your spiritual growth is not a personal matter for you. It is a matter for your family. It is a, it is a, it is a generational matter. If you're a parent, your spiritual growth is a generational matter. It will help your children to grow. So take wherever you are and move forward. Uh, read your Bible more. Get to know it more. Um, grow in your spiritual walk. Don't be, don't be stopped.